I'm living like fighting. Banizak was born on September 4th, 2016, and soon after, he had some tough and scary challenges causing him to be in the hospital longer. Well, Wyatt was born prematurely, so when he was born, he was pretty quickly taken to the NICU, and um, they discovered that he had had some strokes when he was born, and they weren't sure about his breathing. So they took him pretty quickly to the to the NICU, and he, he spent... Quite a, quite a few weeks in the NICU, doing some OT and getting some extra services. While he was in the NICU, Wyatt wasn't able to suck when he was born, so he wasn't able to take in any nutrients, so he had to be, so he had to have a feeding tube. For a while he had a feeding tube until his dad was able to, to start to feed him. He never was able to feed with me, but his dad was able to feed him. Even after Wyatt was able to eat from a bottle, his troubles didn't end there. So um, Wyatt had his head surgery when he was about two months old. When they um, they discovered that he didn't have any soft spots, so then he needed to have what they called cranial stenostosis surgery. <laughs> and the surgery was, I think, about six hours long. And what they did was they basically just cut out a section of his skull so that he could um, his skull could reform as it healed, and he could have some soft spots so his brain could grow. After his surgery, then he had to wear a helmet for um, several months. One, to protect his skull, but two, to um, reshape his head. And he wore that for uh, probably probably about a year. And now he's, he's doing well. His skull like hasn't quite healed perfectly. So he has had some, um, he's gonna have to have some plastic surgery in the future. And the doctors have told us that Probably when he's about eight years old, he'll have to have another surgery to open up his skull again. Just a couple months later, Wyatt returned to the hospital for yet another surgery. When Wyatt was born, one of the ducts in his heart that usually closes right after birth hadn't closed. So um, a couple months after he was born, then they decided to work on closing that and he had catheter surgery to close the duct. 
And at first it didn't take very well. And a couple months later though, they realized that the duct had closed with the catheter surgery. And now he's, he's doing great. He's doing really, really well. He's got a ton of energy and he's doing super. Now that Wyatt has overcome his past surgeries, he will still need a lot of support. We had some genetic testing done with, with Wyatt and we found out that he has um, a genetic disorder and um, through that genetic disorder we also found out that he has autism. So now Wyatt has a lot of specialized um, supports to help him with his autism and, you know, he's a really fun little guy. He's just got, you know, some extra challenges, but he's a cool kid. Wyatt receives a lot of family support, which has helped him a lot along the way. His social skills are a little different than what, say, a five-year-old that didn't have skull surgery and ADHD would have. So that, that kind of concerns me. Today's kids, I think, hit much greater opportunity for developing who they are and where their strengths are and then people working with them through their weaknesses than when I was at, in school. When I was in school, you just kind of had to follow. And if you were a little different, well, you just fell behind. It's not like that anymore. So he's given so many more opportunities. Uh, but whenever my mother-in-law is here and she sees all the great things that he's doing, she gets all excited because she says, oh, that's our miracle baby. <laughs> because she didn't expect with all of the issues that he had that he'd be able to walk and jump and do all the things a normal five-year-old kid does. Yeah, I, need to, I have a billion to do. I need to do this all day. After seeing the progress Wyatt's made so far, we are excited to see where he goes in the future. Wide in the studio. Stand by. Roll for record. Ten. Ten. Eight, eight, nine. Nine. Eight. eight, eight seven, seven. Seven. Six. Six. Five. Five. Four. Four. Three. Three. Two. One. Uh, my name is Evan Waters. I am a producer here at Plum Media. So I do the budgeting and writing and uh, planning for productions. Basically started back in college. I interned here at Plum Media uh, the summer before my senior year of college. I think the biggest thing I've learned is how to communicate well um, in terms of keeping people up to date on things, email etiquette, uh, you know, covering all your bases with people you communicate with. I mean, that's the most important skill as a producer is being able to communicate both the message of your clients and what they're trying to say in their project, but also communicate with them in the planning and production. A good lesson learned was I was producing this one video that was on location at a bridal shop. It was supposed to just take a few hours but we didn't work out ahead of time having the building to ourselves, so there were customers coming and going a lot, so the door was dinging and the salespeople were talking and the customers were talking and walking around. So we kept stopping because we were interviewing the owner of the shop. So it took longer, which wasn't the end of the world, but the problem was I forgot to schedule a lunch break, so <laughs> my crew was pretty grumpy and hungry by the end of it because yeah, I didn't feed them. And so. It harkens back to my film professor in college who's, who said, good food, good mood, which is very true. My biggest piece of advice, and this might sound cheesy, but is just having a positive attitude. Just being the person who's positive and enthusiastic. Being enthusiastic, that can set somebody apart from the crowd. I had years where I wasn't working full time and I considered going into something else and I'm really glad I didn't. There is no typical day here. I've learned a ton from everybody here. We show up, make a big mess, and then go back home. <laughs> it's really fun and it's really cool and rewarding to see something you've worked on 
funneled through whoever's producing a project into a single project and then see it all come together at the end. This is Queer Talk Milwaukee, where we highlight LGBT voices, businesses, and community centers in the local area. Today, I met up with Brad Shilakowski, co-founder and executive director of Courage MKE, to talk about his program and what they provide. So my husband and I were foster parents uh, because we wanted to adopt our own our daughter together because I came to a relationship with kids already. So in that time, they knew that our daughter could share a room with someone, so they started sending us teenage girls identified as LGBT. And their stories of torment and rejection and bullying from group homes and shelters just is really what inspired us to start this. What kind of things does the center provide? Well, we provide housing for up to five kids a night. They're aged 12 to 17. Uh, they all come to us through the social welfare system in some way, shape, or form, whether that's foster care or juvenile justice. Um, if a child comes to us when they're 12, they can stay with us until they age out. Um, there's no set limit for as long, I mean, as long as they're following the rules and being active participants in the house as a family here, um, they can stay. Um, and then, yeah, the other question I had is why did you want to be a part of it, but since you create it, is there anything else you just wanted to add to, like, the importance of it, or? Um, it's. I would just say the importance of it is because when you look at even just the foster care system, most people want the little babies, right? They want the little kids. Um, these teens or young or preteens that are in our house right now, they've probably been in the system, most of them, most of their life. Um, so why it's important to me is because these kids are not in their own home by no fault of their own and I want we we all here want to give them that opportunity to have somewhat of a normal life. After hearing Brad talk about how LGBT youth tend to struggle in middle and high school, I started to look into the public education system and talking with Manny Saudi about her education experience. Oh, what was your education like? Like, did you have like a GSA at school or? So, a really funny story, we did have a GSA. I never wound up joining it. And then it got switched over to, I forget what other program it was that just was like, the, I think it was like the diversity committee or something like that. So they kind of were like, okay, well, we need to be more inclusive, which was fine and all. But I never wound up joining it. I considered it at some points and then I was kind of like, meh. So then did your school do like the day of silence and all that or? Uh, there were, I think one year there were a couple kids that did it, um, but it wasn't like, I don't think organized at all, it was just kids that knew about it and just did the day of silence. So then in your general education, did you have anything, any uh, like education on any of it or? On just like any sort of LGBTQ, yeah. culture, history, any, not specifically like, you know, like there were like certain like bits and pieces that would come up, but. Nothing like really in specific. You didn't have like gay 101? <laughs> no, 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 no. I wish we would have had gay 101. I would have taken that class and then I would have made it a rule. I would have gone to the principal and been like, hey, anybody says anything homophobic has to take this class. <laughs> After talking to Mandy, I realized I also didn't really get taught LGBT history in school and met up with Liam Janae who shared a similar experience. What was your education like? Were you taught like queer culture or history or? We learned a little bit about Stonewall, but like not a whole lot. There is not a lot of LGBTQ education in public schools. I think we did a in AP Human Geography. We did a little bit on it. That was freshman year. But other than that, I, I learned all of that on my own. Do you ever participate in the Day of Silence? Or is that a thing at your school? Yeah, we just had that recently. On the Day of Silence, they handed out like oh, what color ribbons I, aren't they purple i think they're purple ribbons i think so we got pins so they said different okay. things every year yeah but they handed those out to everybody and we did have i don't we didn't do like a school-wide thing but having the ribbons and having people support that day of silence for a reason is good yeah i'm our, our school did they never educated us as to why we did that 
at all. Our school, yeah, our school was basically just like, hey, this is to support this. Yeah. It Exa wasn't really why. And I guess I just kind of assumed it was t like in solidarity of the people who couldn't come out. The Day of Silence is a national student-led demonstration where LGBT students and allies take a vow of silence to protest the harmful effects of harassment and discrimination of LGBTQ youth in schools. The Day of Silence is typically run by a GSA or a Gay-Straight Alliance in middle or high school. The reason it's important to pay attention to the education system regarding to LGBT culture and history is that there's a lot of people who are figuring out who they are at younger ages. For more background, Mandy and Liam also shared their personal discovery. So basically, I kind of realized when I was like 12, that I had a crush on my best friend. And I was like, uh-oh, this is weird. She's a girl. What do I do? <laughs> Gay panic. And I kind of realized, oh, you know what? Maybe I just kind of like girls sometimes. And I went with like the bi label as an identifier at that point. Because I was like, that makes sense. I like guys. I like girls. Didn't know much more than that. Kind of started coming out to some friends who all took it well. Um, come out to one of my family members who's kind of like, hey, you know, this might just be a phase. We all had that moment in high school and middle school. And I'm like, I, I still think it's a little suspicious, but that's just me. <laughs> uh, but decided to come out once and for all as Pan in 2016 to my family. Um, they all took it really well. Um, my sister was like, I called it. I knew it. Since, like, pan can mean, like, different things for people, what does it mean to you? Like, to me, personally, pan is just, I don't care about gender. Like, that doesn't really, like, matter to me. How you present, how you identify as gender-wise has nothing to do with it. I care more about personality, and I find that to be pretty exact. There's certain things I like on anybody, like, when it comes to personality. You gotta be funny, you know, you gotta love animals, kind of, like, that sort of stuff. I, I think I came out a lot earlier than a lot of other people. I, or at least I knew earlier than other people. Like, I came out when I was 12, so I was in seventh grade, and I had a girlfriend before this. Like, literally like a month before I came out, I was like, um, no, I'm gay. I'm gonna break up with you. And then I told Make my parents as so well. I, she was a bad person, but okay. anyway. <laughs> I, uh, decided to come out on New Year's Eve dinner. That was interesting because there was alcohol already involved with some people, emotions were running hot, there were a lot of tears, but it ended up good. My parents have like always been really, really supportive, my entire family actually. Did you have like a specific plan for that or was there like any specific event I mean, for, for it or was it just like, oh yeah, by the way? I wanted to be kind of theatric. I don't know why, I just felt like it, but it really didn't end well. Because I was like, I, I remember starting the conversation. I was like, oh, you know why I broke up with her? And my mom was like, because you didn't like her? And I was like, well, yeah, but also. And then I started crying. <laughs> and then she started crying. She's like, I don't know why we're crying. And I'm like, I'm gay. <laughs> uh -uh. Because I came out so early, though, there were a lot of people, or not a lot of people. My main family was like, are you sure? Is this just a phase? And I was like, no, no, not at all. One of my friend's moms thought that I was saying that I was gay just to sleep in the same bed as my friend. <laughs> and she told her that. And I was, she was like, or my friend was like, no, definitely not. Not true at all. He is very, very, very homosexual. <laughs> Even though the public school system is lacking in LGBT education, Mandy and Liam were fortunate enough to have a decent school and supportive friends and family. However, I know there's a lot of kids and young adults struggling to find a supportive outlet, and while we are noticing a progressive change in the local area, we still have a long way to go. And for anyone struggling, although it might be different than some of the stories you heard today, Brad, Mandy, and Liam shared some of their advice. It's okay to, to take help. It's okay to to accept help from those that are offering it to you. I understand why there's a wall up of so many people that you counted on let you down. I've seen firsthand the amount of people that are willing to 
wrap their arms around you and put a big hug around you in some way, shape, or form just by starting this organization. My best advice to you is build a support system. Find a support system, whether it be friends, family, reaching out to places like those because I know they can be a huge help. Um, and just being yourself, just like fighting against like just the overwhelming urge to just be like, nope, I'm done. I'm one of the straights now, don't do it. It's not worth your happiness. But reaching out to anybody and everybody who can be like an ally of any sort is gonna be the best way to make yourself kind of, I don't know, like safe. Because I know there's dangerous situations out there with people, but if you have that community, you have that support, there's always a way, you know? Nobody has the right to know your sexuality. Don't rush things. Find, finding yourself takes a lot of time. And if you don't feel comfortable with other people knowing that at that time, then don't rush that. It's all about you.